Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next Farm Bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts. This episode is brought to you by Omsom, the new pantry staple brand bringing proud, loud Asian flavors into your kitchen. This week on Meet and 3, we continue our trade series with a piquant look at the many faces of the spice trade. From the high price tag of saffron to the ubiquity of chilies and the potential ripple effect that farmer protests in India may have on the global spice market. You know, farmers are, are protesting because they feel like their lives and livelihoods are on the line. You find it in a lot of cured foods like cured meat and Parmesan cheese. Um, you also find it in ripening foods like ripe tomatoes are very high in uh, MSG. So there's sources of it all over the natural world. Tune in to Meet and 3, HRN's weekly food news roundup, wherever you get your podcasts. Hello and welcome to Snacky Tunes. I am one half of your host, Darren Bresnitz. Hope everyone is staying safe and staying sane. Uh, hope you're taking some time for yourself, for some loved ones, and getting in the kitchen, cooking when you can. And if you're looking for some inspiration in the kitchen, I would check out Ned Baldwin's How to Dress an Egg. We sat down with him last May uh, with a virtual conversation hosted by Ken and Michelle over at Now Serving. Go check them out, nowservingla.com. And it is a great conversation, and I have to admit, we misplaced it. We were moving files from one computer to another, and we didn't know where it went. And the other day, I discovered it, so we wanted to share it with all of you. How to Dress an Egg is one of our favorite cookbooks to come out last year. It is a really great step-by-step building process on recipes, teaching you some great basics and how to improve them. It's going to be a great cookbook, I think, for the summer and the springtime because it really is a lot of fresh ingredients, a lot of great inspiration. And if you're like me, you are probably pretty tired of some of your culinary standards coming out of your kitchen right now. So this is a book. It's beautiful. The photography is incredible. And it's just a lot of great, delicious inspiration. So please sit back, relax, and enjoy Ned Baldwin live from Now Serving from May of 2020 here on HRN. We talk about food. We talk about music with musical dudes. Finger on the pulse, snacky tunes. Hi, everyone. I'm Ken from Now Serving here in Los Angeles. Uh, we are thrilled to host another virtual book talk. Uh, today's book is How to Dress an Egg uh, by Chef Ned Baldwin of Houseman restaurant in New York City. Ned is here. Hi, Ned. Hi. And uh, speaking with him today is a friend of the shop. Uh, he is uh, from Snacky Tunes podcast and director of original series from Taste Made. We have Darren Bresnitz here. Hi, Darren. Hey, thanks for having me back. Good to see you as always. Um, great for having both of you here doing a, an LA, New York thing. Um, we're going to talk about uh, this great new book that's on a bunch of uh, best of um, best of the spring cookbook lists already, and um, I'll let Darren and Ned take it away. Please, if you do have some questions uh, for Chef, um, have at it at the uh, the Q and A section here. So, thanks a lot, guys. Yeah, thank you. Uh, 
Ned, welcome. Congratulations on the book. It uh, definitely sits on one of my lists, or I guess I have a list of favorite um, cookbooks to come out uh, this spring. Super enjoyable, read it cover to cover, smiled, laughed, got some inspiration for the kitchen. So, so really great job on this all around. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what's the reaction been to the book? How do you feel now that you've, you've not just burst it, uh, but now it's been out in the world and it's walking around on its own two legs. I'm, I'm really, really proud of the book. And, uh, I, I, I think that if I wasn't proud, I would be able to say that. <laughs> like, I think it's a cool book. I mean, you know, uh, like restaurants, making a cookbook is a, is a team effort. So, you know, I wrote it with Peter mm -hmm. Kaminsky, who's written 17 books, cookbooks, uh, including Francis Malman's and, um, uh, a bunch of other fabulous books that sit on my shelves already. Uh, and then uh, Christopher Hersheimer and Melissa Hamilton shot the photographs. They're just giant rock star photographers. And um, the designers at HMH did incredible work. So, you know, uh, I, I've been joking all along. Like, I'm not totally sure how I got in this amazing team. Um, so I'm just like, I, I'm kind of blown away by how cool it is. And, um, uh, you know, the world is... Uh, not normal and um but I, you know I, I think uh there's a vision of like you put a book out and you know if you're a certain person who has a certain amount of platform you like go hurtling around the country and it's released in england you go to london you do demos and whatever but I'm, my platform is is less and so the funds devoted to a book tour were uh expected to be considerably less so i yeah. I, I, I suspect that the I mean, I would have gone to a few places, but uh, we're not so far off doing what we would the way we would have been doing it anyway. And I think that's kind of cool. I mean, publishing is weird, uh, uh, <laughs> without going into great detail. Uh, and and one of the weirdnesses it does seem that in many cases books are sent out into the wild to survive on their own merits. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I mean, uh, platform matters, but uh, I think this book the feedback I'm getting is like people are using it, especially now that they're cooking at home a lot uh, and that the recipes are working for them, which I'm hugely relieved and gratified yeah. to hear. And <laughs> I was definitely have been stressed out every day about that. Um, and, uh, and people are charmed by it. It's, you know, it's a moment where there's a lot of, uh, of dread and it's bringing some lightness to people's lives. So that's uh, if I can have a little contribution that way, that feels great. Well, let's talk about uh, the approach to the book. Um, I have the uh, content page up here and you break it down into 20 different sections, 20 different ingredient led chapters. Um, and it is obviously the timing, you know, I believe you said you started this book in 2015. I don't yeah. think you knew that you'd be in a pandemic and the majority of everyone in America be cooking at home right now, but it is like the perfect book for the moment. Um, but beyond the moment, let's talk about the approach itself, how you broke it down, and how to follow and, and really get the most out of this book. Right. Well, so uh, I, I'm like, a, I'm a maker. I was a maker before I was a cook. I made cabinetry. I made art. I made ceramics, a lot of stuff. And one of the things I've learned as a maker of things is that um, you learn a technique, and then you figure out how to be creative with that technique. So whether that's learning how to draw a hand or draw a floor plan or draw or, or, you know, throw a cup on a wheel, whatever. Uh, once you learn the mechanics of that simple thing, then you apply it to a lot of things. So that's the way this book is structured. We show you how to boil an egg, super simple stuff. Not that you don't already know how to boil an egg, but you know, some people may not about egg boiling. Yep. Yeah. And then we show you a bunch of ways to dress it up. That's where the title of the book came from. So, we show this wonderful way to poach fish that I learned in Norway when a friend taught me how to poach fish in seawater. Uh, and then, you know, that's super simple. The ingredient is water and the fish, pretty much. There's a teeny bit of nuance, but basically that's it. And then we show a bunch of ways to make recipes with that. So, and times 20. So it's, uh, that's, that's sort of the concept. Uh, and as you said, I think that for people who don't cook, but also I think, I don't know. I can't not be the cook that I am. So uh, we wanted to uh, we wanted to try to speak to people with different levels of comfort in the kitchen. Yeah, I um, I definitely appreciate that in this book. 
because with each chapter, somehow I was like, I know how to do this. This reinforces that I've been doing it, at least in the realm of rightness, according to this book. Um, and then there's some things where I went, oh, that's why my broccoli or my steak or my chicken or is not turning out maybe the restaurant way or, or at least a stepped up at home way. So it was a good reinforcement of, of the fundamentals, which I think um, are really important to you. You know, you open up the book um, talking about the fundamentals and about um, learning how to, to really cook. So what are the important fundamentals to you? I know that you have quite a few, but something that just applies to anyone who might be getting into a kitchen for the first time, someone who's been cooking for a minute, or even people who, and we've talked about this before, the fundamentals that used to be important or, or well-known in kitchens has shifted over the years. So what do you think is important to know now? Right. Well, so uh, I think that one of the things that was scary to me when I was learning how to cook and that might be scary to a lot of people is, uh, or daunting even, is to think that you have to have a sort of a canon of knowledge about, uh, about cooking. Like you have to know the fundamentals and the fundamentals of this sort of big abstract quantity of things. And I actually don't, that's not how this book works. And it's not, uh, especially as a home cook, it's not what I think. I think that you can learn how to do one thing, whether that, and each one of these chapters represents one thing. Like you can learn how to roast a chicken. That's a great one. Cause you, you know, you right. can just use, you pull it out of your pocket whenever you need to. Yeah. And if you, you learn that simple recipe that, you know, the basic recipe in that chapter is a chicken and salt and oil. And if you want to serve it with a squeeze of lemon afterwards, go for it, but it's fine without it too. Uh, that's, that's a fundamental recipe. It's not the fundamentals, the canon of cooking, you know? So I, I think like learn a thing, goof around with it and then learn another thing. You're not applying for, as a home cook, you're not applying for a job at a, at a three Michelin star restaurant. You just want to cook delicious food at home. And you, sh you know, so if you can just learn how to do one of those things, that's the first step. And, and uh, you start to understand that when you can roast a, a beautiful bird, like the one that, that I have up, it goes so far, right? So like, let's say you have a family and you, you, you make this bird, you can have that for dinner with some sides, but then you can turn it into chicken salad for a sandwich, or you can just look at it in different ways, which I think is also really important now, especially if you're doing bulk cooking or, or cooking over, over a couple of days uh, where you need food and you just make one big meal and things like that. Um, but the great thing about the book is that, and, and to, to play off of that, is that you do allow for inspiration. Like it is in many ways a blank canvas um, that in, it really encourages people to then riff on their own. Where have you found in this book some of your favorite riffs, some of your favorite like modifications on, I don't know, recipes that are, are standard, but you've made your own and you've shared with people? Hmm. That's interesting. Well, I mean, I just describe how the chapters came into being, uh, because I think, you know, some cook, some cookbooks are like catalogs of yeah. recipes that chefs already have that they do in the restaurant or wherever they, wherever they, wherever they learn them, their mom or whatever. And this is not how this book came about. The, the, you know, each of these 20 chapters kind of did these 20 chapters each started with a recipe that I, uh, I'm very familiar with, comfortable with, and have done a zillion times, and that I think is extremely useful and ap applicable in the home. But then the subsequent chapters, the dress it up chapters, were almost none of them recipes that I'd ever done before. Mm. So uh, that was really fun to me, and sort of like menu writing, it, to the extent that you know when you write a menu, you want a range of different things to eat, which are not redundant and which uh, appeal to different tastes or times or whatever. So, you know, the, the goal with each chapter, we're talking about the roast chicken to, you know, so we show how to roast the chicken and then we show around four ways to serve that chicken. And, and so I came up with each one of those, you know, uh, uh, I guess some of them were recipes that I'd done in the restaurant and, but then simplified. Um, but the idea is to not overlap and to, you know, uh, 
appeal to a different season or a different um, appetite or whatever like that. So it was a, uh, the book was a giant opportunity for me to be creative in that mm. way. I mean, yeah. that creativity, not just the creativity itself, but to show that you can be creative sometimes doesn't really come through in cookbooks. I think you see that now in some cookbooks where you're like, oh, it's a little, it's a mix it, make it your own. But in many ways they can be intimidating. Um, mm. How did you work with uh, the writers and the, and the photographers to make this a really obtainable, something that could be both inspirational for like a chef in a restaurant, but also a home cook? Well, so Pete, Peter Kaminsky, who I wrote the book with, uh, is a, uh, is a real home cook. He, he, um, despite that he was the restaurant critic for New York magazine for a good stretch time and, sure. uh, has a, has a strong relationship with the restaurant, uh, universe in New York. He actually doesn't eat out all that often, hmm. uh, and cooks, you know, cooks for his family or his friends at home, uh, m many nights of the week. So, uh, he and I, I just probably shouldn't even say this because at the end of the day, I think, <laughs> but uh, he and I tested the recipes together first. So, uh, he, you know, he, he ended up being a great filter. He is not a restaurant cook, hmm. you know? So if, if, if he, he really did a great job of, you know, I'd propose a recipe and he would, <laughs> he'd really think about what it would feel like for him to cook that at home. I know? love that. Yeah. Can yeah. you share beyond, one? Beyond thinking. Oh God. You, I mean, can you share one that didn't make it in because of that, of that litmus test? We got, I think hard about salt. Salt mm -hmm. really is what makes your food taste good, but it's also what can make your food taste bad. And, um, uh, there, I'm not sure what the, um, what the threshold is for uh, profanity on the show, but there, there, there are a lot of ways to fuck it up with salt. <laughs> and, and our, our, our goal uh, expressed multiple times through the process is uncountable times was to make recipes that were to the greatest extent possible, unfuck up And uh, uh, so there were, there were some tricky things that I like to do with salt um, using scales and percentages or, mm -hmm you know, in the cod recipe that I mentioned before, the poached cod in seawater or poached any fish in seawater, more or less. Uh, you know, I was, I really wanted to get as close as I could to making an, uh, 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 to simulate seawater using seaweed and, uh, the, you know, studying the average salinity of seawater, which is around 2.5%. Um, and, uh, you know, he, at a certain point he was like, no, like this, there's no way that it's too much. You know, it was like, He's like just, just stop. You've, you've lost people. Salt percentages. Yeah. Guess this already out. tastes yeah. great. This already tastes great. Like back, back away. And then I, I, I think probably more than anything, actually, his influence was, and this is like one of the things I learned most in writing this book was about. Uh, writing recipes, writing an elegant recipe, which is, you know, uh, uh, it, this is just goes down to good design. It doesn't matter whether it's a bottle or a poem or a recipe or a, mm. a, a, a omelet. The fewer things you do, the more elegant the thing is, and the stronger those few things are, the better it is. So like a recipe that's like, you know, three pages long and has 600 ingredients and a uh, very low, I'm not sure how to say this, but it's easily fuck upable. That's, that's, that's not an elegant, beautiful recipe. And Pete, Pete really was like, can we do it without this? Can we do it without that? Yeah. Can we remove this step? Can we remove that step? And, uh, you know, I, I, my, my end of things was always like, it's gotta be delicious, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, yeah, you can't like, you know, do you want it to not taste like anything? But he wanted it to be elegant and simple, you know, and uh, that I, I want that too. And, yeah. and, and, and more today than, um, because I think, you know, they're like uh, different stages, I think different evolution. I mean, people, some people are just born this way, but I think there are evolutions in Cook's uh, life. If you're a recipe writer where, you know, how do I make this delicious? Like, the young chef is like, I throw the 
everything. Kitchen sink at it. Everything's like in. Acid is high and the salt is high and there are 45 herbs and 23 crunchy things and whatever. And, uh, I, you know, I think as you, as you settle and get, not settle for, but settle in, you know, and, and become a little cooler, you can find ways to get the power out of uh, fewer but writer ingredients. I think there's that argument of something being interesting and then something being satisfying. Mm -hmm. And I think that there is a certain satisfaction in that refined elegance that right. comes with confidence. Totally. I think about, I, I think about one of the iconic dishes when I think about this concept is uh, for me, uh, is one of Gabrielle Hamilton's dishes that uh, I worked at Prune for a bunch of years. And uh, one of her dishes is, uh, is uh, these gigantic shrimp that are cooked on the grill mm -hmm. and that are dressed with a butter that she calls anchovy butter. She calls it anchovy butter because it's a compound, it's a uh, fur fondue or bermonte or whatever. It's a uh, emulsified butter that's just loaded with anchovies. Uh, and it's the dish is that, the butter, the anchovy, and a piece of lemon, period. And, you know, it's like getting punched in the face. It's amazing. And it's like there are no ingredients. So cool. Yeah. And that, except for, uh, you know, 20 years of experience and confidence behind the grill, right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so you bring up the design of the book and I want to, I want to talk about it because it really is a beautiful mix of photography and text and then illustration. Um, before we sort of get into the individual elements, how did you do, uh, land on this approach? What made you want to have um, font heavy, photography heavy, and illustration heavy all come together to feel that is something very unified uh, uh, and unique? Right. Well, uh, the, the illustrations and the lettering are done by a fellow whose name is Gerardo Blumenkrantz, who is a uh, insane genius um, who uh, I had the great fortune to meet as the restaurant was being born. And he, um, he and I have kind of an old fashioned relationship where he, he, um, he draws mostly on the subway while he goes to work. And uh, some of his illustrations are uh, totally unsuitable for the restaurant. <laughs> uh, and some of them are, but in any event, he sends me pictures that he likes and uh, and then when he comes to the restaurant, he eats for free. So we just, we trade food for, for art. And Great. Great uh, uh, yeah, it's fantastic. And we put there, our menu, we print every day. Uh, we'll see what that turns into when we come, come back into being. But, uh, uh, you know, at this point, I think we have something like 50 or 60 illustrations, you know, on the computer. So when we, when we lay out the menu every night, we're like, oh, what kind of day is today? Oh, let's pick the you know, the, the, this, this fellow that looks a little bit like Humpty Dumpty that's on the screen right now Yeah, or, or whatever. So he, he is really a large part of the look feel of the restaurant. I think people love the drawings. They, I think regulars are like, you know, get familiar with some of the drawings or excited to see a new one or whatever. And when the, um, when the editors and my agent were in the restaurant kind of, uh, editors were, we were getting to know after we had a proposal, Seeing that it was really clear that he was part of the story and we wanted as, as much of him to be part of the story as possible. I, he and I, I, I mean, I, I said that he, that he does a lot of drawings that are not, not appropriate for the rest. And I just think he and I both share sort of a, uh, strange sense of humor and, uh, uh, un, unbridled whatever. And, uh, so I think the, the gestalt of his work f fits. You know, it fits with the overall mission, whether it's a restaurant or the book. Yeah, I think you can um, get a hint of that naughtiness in some of some of these illustrations. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then the photography is really great because I think you have a good balance of really beautiful, fully plated, artistic beauty shots. And then you have some of these process shots. I'm thinking about the... Um, like the pork shoulder in the Dutch oven or this fish oh, on the that's plate. That's such a great picture. And, and I look at that and I go like, oh, because I've made pork shoulder at home. I was like, I have seen that in my own kitchen. Mm -hmm. And I think there is that visual confidence of these recipes, both at the beginning and then the uh, artistic aspiration at the end 
that really says you can do this. Uh, uh-huh. But uh-huh. I'd love to hear how you work with the f- photographer and how you picked um, these style because they're very rich, they're very food focused. You know, it's very much about the plate uh, right. more than anything else and the food on it. Well, so Christopher and Melissa, who took the pictures, uh, Hersheimer and Hamilton, uh, made, I think, I'll just say some of my favorite cookbooks uh, that exist in, Eng- in English. There are the Canal House books, and they're small, and they're uh, uh, very impressionistic, and really set you in the moment. And I, I have so much respect for them. They, made, they make the books from start to finish. Like, they come up with the recipes, they write the text, which is beautiful. They take the photographs, which are beautiful. They do the layouts and the books are self-published. They're just stunning, amazing cookbooks. And uh, I'm impressed by the photography for a particular reason, which is Christopher is a, an incredibly mature and accomplished uh, photographer. It's unusual for a photographer of her skill to not make photographs that are self-referential, that are not like uh, about the photograph. <laughs> uh, I'm quoting somebody, but I don't remember who right there. Uh, and uh, Hers aren't like they're just like about the food and they make you want to eat the food and in her books They make me want to eat the food. So yeah. when I was thinking about who was going to take these the pictures for the book uh, She was the, you know, I, when I when it, the thought crossed my mind that I could even have the gumption to ask them to do it I you know, it was clear that I had to so uh, I was just lucky enough uh, that they thought it was an okay idea to do it um, and then I'll just say that the actual taking of the photographs was easily one of the most pleasurable creative experiences of my life. Oh my God. We just like, there was just the three of us and Peter in this lovely house out in the North Fork, uh, two six day stretches where I would, you know, we'd have an agenda for the day. And I kept an Instagram as Peter and I were testing the book, uh, where I took pictures just so I could remember what we did. And, you know, so I took the pictures, so not that great, but they <laughs> do show, they do show the finished dish. So I'd be like, okay, we're going to do the beets with cilantro and seeds and chilies today. This is what it looks like. And I could show them the picture and then they'd be like, okay. And I, I was so stressed as I went into it. Like I didn't know whether I was supposed to be like the, the perfect three Michelin sous chef who's like super prepped out and everything's labeled and perfect. Or if I was home cooking and I should do the home cooking for the photography um, which is ended, what I ended up kind of doing. And so, which was great because I'd be like, oh, hey, here's the porgy that I'm about to grill with the, and here's the, here are the garnishes. Mm. And Christopher would be like, or Melissa would be like, oh, okay, stop. And, and here, you know, I handed to them on a cutting board or whatever. And they'd be like, okay, we'll take a picture. So it was, it was very improvisatory. Like for the, for the beef tongue chapter. Oh yeah. Um, one of the, the, I love beef tongue and uh, I, I have rarely cooked it at home in the past, but it somehow at one day, like the thought crossed my mind that the reason I don't cook it at home is because it doesn't fit into any home size pots. Yeah. <laughs> and it, and, and it just never occurred to me to cut it into pieces. Like why mm-hmm. not? Right. So I'm like looking at a home size pot and I'm looking at the tongue. I'm like, all right, cool. Let's cut it up. So that's part of the recipe. So then I was getting the recipe ready, you know, for the, for when we were going to take pictures of that chapter and I had cut the tongue into four pieces and it was on this nice, uh, sort of teak ish cutting board. And I was like, here you go guys. And one of those, like one of my favorite pictures in the world of this amazing tongue. That's that. And, and, uh, if you've ever worked with tongue in any sort of, uh, medium, you know, it is a tough, Tough thing to make bookworthy beautiful, if you will. Um, <laughs> despite how delicious it is, and now now uh, our grandma cooks a, a great beef tongue, but we only ever saw it chunked up. And I remember the first time when I saw a full beef tongue, I went, "Oh, that is something. That is something to look at." Um, mm-hmm. But you know, look, you do the same thing with vegetables, right? You literally have a page in the broccoli section that is a wood cutting board, and then just the head of a broccoli. And if you've ever cooked broccoli at home, you, you've seen that. Um, and I like, hey, Karen? I, yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Can we see some of the, the pictures? Oh yeah, I've been sharing it. Has it not been coming through? No, I'm sorry. Hmm, let me see, let me go out again. Um, 
So, um, you know, one of the things that yeah. I love is the, uh, is how much respect you treat the vegetables here with the exact same amount as you treat the beef tongue or the shoulders or anything like that. Right. Um, that's happening in peril. We do that at the restaurant too. I, I yeah. Uh, I really just, uh, you know, uh, I love cooking vegetables. I love eating vegetables. Um, and, uh, I don't, I, you know, after I, it, after I left prune, uh, I, I didn't work in restaurants for, uh, some, some months. And I read a ton about eating vegetarian and cooking vegetables and thought really hard about why it's, why it's difficult to make a, make vegetable entree or veg. Like what's the difference? Like what's the big difference? And at the end of the day, uh, I, I had a lot of, a lot of stupid giant philosophical thoughts about it that I wrote a bunch of boring stuff about, but, uh, suffice to say, I love cooking vegetables. This one is a great one. Actually, Peter, Peter's daughter just cooked this one and did a nice story about it, uh, on her, on her Instagram. This is beet caponata, um, that came about when I did a, um, a, a dinner at Scribe Winery in Sonoma. And it was in the, it was in the spring and I was doing, uh, a uh, slow cooked lamb shoulders for 60 people or so. And, uh, I really had wanted to do a regular caponata, but it was spring, yeah. not eggplant season. No. And, uh, uh, and Emma, my friend who, uh, Emma lip, who was running the food there at the time, uh, and is opening a restaurant in Sonoma, uh, as we speak, fortunately slash unfortunately, um, came into the kitchen and was like, Hey, I just dug up these beets. And I don't know why, but I was like, oh, yeah, beet caponata, totally. Why not? Um, and it, it, uh, that's, that's a dish I'm really proud of. I think it's really uh, unexpected and very delicious. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's great. And it also shows how you can make and serve these dishes for a lot of people. And that pops up a lot in your book about the importance of family style. Um, mm -hmm which is how a lot of us are eating right now. But also, um, man, I guess I never thought about it. One of my favorite ways that I used to eat at a restaurant, I don't know how much family style is going to be embraced moving forward in a restaurant, but at least when I'm at home, I love the idea of making a whole chicken, making a bunch of sides, putting it on the table and saying, just build your own plate. Um, it also takes a lot of pressure off of trying to make a nice plate after you cooked a whole meal. Um, and letting people sort of like have a little empowerment. Maybe they want a little bit more beets. Maybe they want a little bit less cod. Um, but why do yeah. you love uh, family style so much? And why did, was that a driving force for how you plated so much food in this book? Um, I've done a lot of large scale, uh, everybody eats at the same time kind of cooking. I suppose every chef, once you kind of, uh, <laughs> uh, it's sort of hard to avoid at a certain point. But I actually really love doing it. Um, and, uh, I, you know, if you're feeding 80 people and um, 80 people don't all know each other and uh, the food, getting involved with the food and passing the food and sharing the food uh, makes a communal experience. I mean, you're already, I suppose, having a communal experience at your table. But I think if you each have your own little plate with salmon and the cucumber salad or whatever it's not the same like uh I, and and for myself <laughs> as a diner uh and in life in general i really like a big a big messy raucous experience that's i i just love it that way and so uh i'm motivated to to make it that way um and so you know a lot of the a lot of the large scale dinners that i do uh, in fact, the format sort of revealed itself where, uh, we'll do, we, it's usually four courses, including dessert, and we'll do, uh, three dishes with each course and not dissimilar to the way I, I was talking about creating the chapters for the book where things are sympathetic, but not redundant. Each course, you know, is to try to make three dishes that are each themselves, not redundant, but that complement each other. Um, and so that, you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think probably it's thinking that way. And then at home, 
I mean, I'm not plating my family's food for each other. <laughs> I mean, you know, we're going to put a chicken on the table, cut it up. Yeah. And to your, to your thing about uh, making a nice plate, I, I think it's e- easier and more dramatic and more wonderful to make a nice plate of one dish that has a complete idea for four people. You know what I mean? So the, 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 the beautiful plate is the share plate, is the big plate that's got all the food on it. This episode is brought to you by Omsom, the new pantry stable brand bringing proud, loud Asian flavors into your kitchen. Omsom partners with iconic Asian chefs to craft rip and pour starters that pack all the specialty sauces, aromatics, and seasonings needed to cook restaurant quality Asian dishes in under 30 minutes. No more diluted dishes, no more cultural compromise. Just bold Asian flavors sitting in your pantry right between the tomato sauce and olive oil. Learn more at omsom.com. That's O-M-S-O-M dot com. I love it. And I love that you're really providing people who are saying like, here's three different, I don't know, paints. Design your own plate. I have done, I have created this. You mix and match your own flavors as you see fit. Right. Um, now, one of my favorite parts in the book uh, is where you wax poetically about sandwiches and if anyone else is like like myself or my family we have been eating a a lot of sandwiches right now and i feel i'd be remiss if i didn't have you give us a couple of of tips on how to build a sandwich and what you're looking for um you know from that that mode of mode of eating right well so uh, we're looking at beans right now, and it's yeah. just easy to stick stick a fork in a couple of beans and get them in your mouth. Yep. They're soft-ish, and uh, they're gonna, you know, they're dressed well. It's sort of a easy, it's an easy eating experience to engineer. But a sandwich is is more complicated for a couple of reasons. Sandwiches can be typically are a bit larger, and they're surrounded by bread. And there are a lot of different kinds of bread. Some bread, maybe it's sliced bread. That bread is soft. The bread can be too soft and get soggy. Or it can be surrounded by some sort of roll, which can be, uh, crust can be extremely hard and difficult to get your teeth through. So what I guess what I'm saying is uh, there are flavors in a sandwich, but there's also the physical experience of eating the sandwich. And um, that's the part that I I think about all of it. But... uh, (laughs) the the physical part really matters so i've th- you know I've, I've thought about this stuff in the abstract a lot but then as we were writing the book i thought oh let's there's got to be a term that describes this challenge problem phenomenon whatever uh and the so the 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 challenge is what what you want from a beautiful sandwich bread in many cases and from a beautiful french fry and and a bunch of other eating experiences is a very very a hard surface but which is very brittle to break through. Mm. And so there's a, there's a term in physics that describes this. It's called indentation fractography. And it describes the amount of pressure it takes to break through a rigid surface. So uh, anyway, that's, that's where we went. So, uh, you know, I mean, I, I'm a sandwich fanatic. I'm crazy about Cuban sandwiches. I'm crazy about banh yep. sandwiches. I'm crazy about pastrami sandwiches. I'm crazy about... I uh, go back to prune. Actually, I've been thinking about this a lot the last couple of days. I haven't made it yet, but there was a, a pumpernickel bread or rye. Mm. It's a black bread with orange marmalade and bacon. Mm. So good. Bacon marmalade sandwich and black pepper, I think. It was kind of, wow. The guy who made it was a sous chef there a million years ago. He has a restaurant in Virginia now or something, I think. Um, but, uh, you know, so like it's, and I think in the thing that we, in that, in that, in that piece, we also talk a little bit about lubrication, <laughs> which really matters a lot. Yeah. I, I, nobody hates a dry sandwich more than me. No, I, uh, I mean, it's, I, I'm with you, but I also like the other end, which is sort of like the, the no resistance, white bread, processed meat, just like sort of all gummy side yeah. of it on the Damn other cheese. side on white bread either that or the sandwich you're discussing but nothing in between right it's got to be one end of the spectrum i think as long as you thought it through beforehand, yeah yeah 
I mean, I, I actually do think what we're, what we're talking about describes uh, our approach to the book, Peter's and mine, and, um, and, and in a way, my sort of approach to the world. One of the, uh, Peter uh, came into the restaurant um, shortly after we opened, and I had just finished reading for the second time uh, his book, The Moon Pulled Up an Acre of Bass, which is about spending the fall striped bass season in Montauk and fishing the whole time. And, you know, he talks about it's not just fishing, he's cooking and he's going around Montauk and talking to people. And his descriptions, there's one meal in particular that he describes where he didn't know people were going to be coming over and he ended up having to cook for a bunch of people. And, you know, he'd written for Daniel Belud or written with him and written with Michelle Richard and a lot of heavyweights. And he has all this residual stuff in his head, but he's in some random house with home ingredients. So he's bringing sort of uh, high cooking to a casual uh, experience. That's, I mean, that, that's, there's a lot of beauty in that to me. And so it's sort of what I'm describing is sort of like a conflation of high and low. Like mm. I'm going to bring as much intellect as possible to the sandwich and as little as possible to three, I want to dumb down three star cooking as much, you know what I mean? Sort of like mix it up a little bit. Uh, the, the, the beauty of the high and the low is one of the first things I learned about when I, uh, I got to New York and was, was working in food, was having respect for, for both poles of uh, the culinary spectrum. Sure. Um, so, you know, there's been a lot of talk in the news recently, and we're not going to get into all the talk in the news, but there has been uh, shortages with meat. And not to make a scare or, or cause a rush of the store or anything, but some people are going to be cooking some vegetables for the first time that they maybe have never seen either through a CSA box or just going to the farmer's market or going to the grocery store. And we don't need to get into a specific vegetable, but if you could just share some inspiration and some confidence with people who are cooking vegetables for the first time, what would, what would you share with them? Because cooking meat, if you cook meat, you sort of have a general how to do it but not a lot of people have really gotten deep with vegetables. That's interesting. Uh, well, first thing to do is, uh, uh, well, there, <laughs> there are some fabulous cookbooks. Um, uh, Yours included. Mine included. Thank you. Um, but uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I think about you've used the, you've used the, the term side a few times. And one of our, one of our rules in the, in uh, rule is a strong word, but uh Sort of, sort of lenses through which we look at uh, vegetable cooking as we, we, we eschew the side. Vegetables are no more sides than meat is, you know? So we take, uh, we take a carrot seriously. We figure out how to cook it nice. We give one method. Uh, and and I'll, maybe I'll say just for a second what that method is because we use it in a lot of our cooking. Uh, we cook low temperature and in a sealed environment. We do that with leeks. We do it with carrots. We do it with beets. Uh, we also do it with the pork shoulder that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea, and we don't add any ingredients. And I think it's sort of a, a, a rustic form of sous vide cooking in a way where the, the, the thing itself is allowed to develop and intensify uh, in flavor. So, uh, and, then, and then once we've cooked that, that one thing and made it delicious and intense, uh, then we, as you have a piece of roasted hanger steak or uh, fish or whatever, and you figure out, oh, how am I going to serve that thing? Like we, tr we treat that vegetable as seriously as we would treat a, 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 a meat or a fish. Um, so, you know, what would be great around this carrot, you know, mm -hmm. um, in this case, uh, you know, this is a citrus salad with almonds and mixed herbs and, and roasted carrots. I mean, I, I eat that for lunch on its own. Yeah. I wouldn't need that's anything the idea. Else. That's the idea. Yeah. yeah. And to me, it's like, you look at this dish and you go like, okay, I have the carrots and, and maybe I have the beets, but maybe I have different greens, you know, maybe I have a little sage, maybe I have different herbs that came in my box. And yeah. uh, maybe I, you know, I have pistachios or, or walnuts or raisins. And you can just like look at this and be like, I can see where I can make substitutions for what I have in my pantry. Totally. And, the, and there's a giant green light for that in this book. Yeah. Definitely. So uh, I want to make sure that we have enough time for questions, but um, 
I want to leave on just a little bit of celebratory note of the book because it is really great. It really has a lot of inspiration. And if people could take one thing, one, one in, inspiration out of the book from the author, from the guy behind it, what would you like them to take out of it? Uh, at the risk of saying something I said before, I, I think that people should just um, pick a recipe with a picture they like or an ingredient they like or whatever and try that, try that chapter. Dive, I think dive into one chapter at a time and start with the basic recipe. Maybe that's leeks. We just went past the leeks. Mm-hmm. A lot of my friends, I'm in a small community with a, with a, a lot of old friends uh, uh, sheltering here and everybody's got the book and everybody's, they've kind of been with me as I've been making the book and we've been talking a lot about it. And uh, you know, people are getting uh, one of the wholesalers in New York is delivering out here. So somebody will get an order of leeks nice. and everybody in the neighborhood's got leeks. So which happened last week. That's uh, amazing. Yeah. It's super cool. And so then they, you know, they're all trying out the leek recipe. So they, and, and you know, they, uh, they'll taste them with the basic recipe, which is just leeks and oil and salt. And then they'll maybe try this recipe with ricotta and hazelnuts and mint, or if they don't have mint, then they're using dill. And if they don't have dill and whatever, and if they don't have ricotta, they're using sour cream or whatever. Uh, And same with the nuts. And then, and this is happening, which is fantastic. Like as you know, uh, and this is the way we're cooking at the moment. Like they make a bunch of leeks, they try them the way I show them how to do it. And then they try, and then eventually they're just making leeks with whatever they got laying around and making them delicious. Yeah. So I think that's the, that's, that was my dream once we figured out what the structure of this book was going to be. And, uh, and, and I'm really gratified to see that it, at least, at least in my little universe of people, that's what's happening. Amazing. Well, Ned, congratulations. Uh, you know, it's such a, such a wonderful book and I'd love to open it up to any questions that people have for you um, about the book. Uh, Ned, I've, I've actually got a question um, and I think we're probably going to have the mushrooms with wilted lettuces tonight. Mm-hmm. Um, so the book is about 20 ingredients. How, how easy or how difficult was it to whittle it down to, to those 20, was there a, a list of 30 that you kind of had to you know? 30 or 35. And in fact, there were, there were probably 30 chapters fully written. Wow. Uh, and, and as soon as you asked that question, I thought, uh, Rux Martin, who was the editor of the book, uh, who was savage in, um, uh, finding the concept that we started with. We didn't, we didn't really start with a concept finding this, finding the concept that we ended up with, and making a dull concept extremely sharp. So, uh, yeah, that there are lots of chapters that we didn't didn't end up with, and some of them were fantastic. I mean, uh, but they didn't quite fit the fit what the book ended up being. There's a, a cucumber chapter that's just raw cucumbers. That there was no, you know, uh, the concept of the book is like cook one thing deliciously, and there was no cooking with the cucumbers. But the recipes were great and uh I, I can't wait to make some excuse to make fit that chapter into the next book <laughs> yeah that's uh that's for the uh the online edition only right yeah or yeah. the 20th the 20th anniversary you just have to you gotta i mean i'm actually about a third of the way third to half of the way through a proposal for the next book and um uh that, that chapter is going to be in there one one way or another <laughs> how to gussy up a cucumber yeah, right exactly exactly yeah and then um, you mentioned earlier that you, you know, before you st- were, co- co- were cooking, you were, you know, a maker of all these, um, you know, of ceramics and furniture and all that stuff. Um, how did you, how did you get into, get into the kitchen? I think I've always been a pretty impassioned eater. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, not on, I'm, I'm just curious how things are made. So, you know, I'd eat some delicious stuff and then I'd start wondering how to make it. And then I'd start reading about how to make it and uh, gradually became uh, a pretty serious home cook. And then, you know, sort of the cool thing about New York is you just meet a 
ton of different people. And I, I ended up meeting a, uh, some people who worked in, in fine dining and, uh, one of them invited him. He, he, he was working at, uh, Ducasse at the Essex house, um, yeah. which at the time was, I think per se was open maybe, but in any event, it was one of the, one of the sort of the finest dining restaurants in New York. And he, he, uh, got me in there for a week. And so I kind of just stood with a silly tall hat on and, um, watched things happen. And, uh, uh, was like, Oh shit, I got to see if I can do this. <laughs> I was really, really curious. It's sort of a combination of a uh, intellectual and athletic and aesthetic challenge all wrapped into one which seemed mm-hmm. pretty delicious. And then, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I would say, you know, there were a lot of things, but that was one of them that, that fellow, by the way, is named Todd Ginsburg and is the chef of a bunch of restaurants in Atlanta now. Amazing. Yeah. Anybody else has any questions there? Um, but Ned, thank you so much for hanging out with us. Thank you. And, and uh, it's a wonderful book. I really appreciate Darren, it. Darren, thank you. Happy birthday to the kid. Happy birthday to Joe. <laughs> Happy birthday, Joe. Um, but you can pick up a. You can pick up a copy of Ned's book, How to Dress an Egg, uh, from our online shop, which is the only way that we're um, selling books right now, um, nowservingla.com. And, uh, yeah, thanks so much again. And uh, you'll really want to uh, jump right into the kitchen when you pick this up. So. And, Ned, if people want to follow along with what you're up to or, or what the restaurant's up to, where can they go? Thanks for asking. Yeah, uh, Houseman Restaurant. Uh, is our Instagram. Uh, and on Wednesdays at six o'clock, did one tonight about beats. Uh, Peter and I have been doing Instagram lives. Just a, It's quick. It's 20 minutes to half an hour cooking demo. We chat a little bit about the book, about the ingredient, maybe about what people are fishing for at the moment. You know, it's uh, loose and uh, probably there's a glass of wine involved. And um, so, yeah, drop in on Wednesdays. And that's 6 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, and I also wanted to say thanks to everybody who donated to Ned's charity of choice, which is uh, World Central Kitchen. They're really doing, you know, they're really superheroes right now doing um, feeding the front line and and also um, getting those restaurants back to work. So, yeah, I'm thinking Jose Andreas, thinking real hard about what what the world's going to look like under these new circumstances. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, we get have another hour chat about that. Probably sure too. Could. Sure could. Right. Wouldn't be as right, much Thank fun. you, everyone. <laughs> thank you. See you later. Thanks. Take care. Bye bye. We talk about food. We talk about music with musical dudes. Finger on the pulse. Snacky tunes. This program is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content and to hear about exclusive events, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Rate the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join our community by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening.